My name is Roger Payne. I'm the director of the Grahmeyer Award for Ideas Improving World Order. In fact, I've been directing the award, I think, for 17 years. Um, 10 or 12 years ago, we gave this award to a book by two scholars, uh, Margaret Keck and Catherine Sicking, um, for their work, uh, Activists Beyond Borders. Um, and uh, that book basically tells the story of transnational social movements and uh, mostly focuses on the development of that in the modern age, lots of emphasis on environmental organizations and human rights organizations, etc. But at the very beginning of that book, there's a discussion of the transnationalization of the anti-slavery movement. If and, I hold um, that, do you want to pull this The anti-slavery movement that is part of the focus of that book was about a movement that was started in Britain and moved to the United States. It was the um, Anti-Slavery International. And the U.S. arm of Anti-Slavery International is a group called Free the Slaves, which Kevin Bales, our um, 2011 winner, is a co-founder of. So in some ways, we've, we've come full circle. They, they focus historically on one of the very first transnational social movements in the world. And the, this year's winner reflects the operation of the transnational social movement to deal with, unfortunately, the same or very similar problem, modern slavery, um, oftentimes referred to as human trafficking. Um, I'm going to keep my introduction relatively short. Um, hopefully you had a chance to pick up the uh, information sheet about uh, the winning ideas in Kevin Bale's biography. I was just going to add a couple of specific details. Uh, we were talking yesterday when I met Kevin at the airport. We both discovered that we lived in Ponca City, Oklahoma at the same time. Uh, Kevin attended the University of Oklahoma. My father was heartbroken that I did not. Um, but uh, he, he received his undergraduate degree from Oklahoma, got a master's degree then at Vanderbilt, where I learned that he taught in the Tennessee prison system. Um, he then went to the uh, University of Mississippi, received a master's degree in history, before ending up at the London School of Economics and spending a great deal of his uh, career in England. Um, he received a PhD at LSE in economic history and sociology. Um, over the course of his career, if you read his biography, you know that he has been an academic, he has been an administrator, obviously he's president of Free the Slaves. He has been an activist, particularly on this um, social issue, global social issue. He has been a policy advisor, he's won many other awards in this issue area. So I am quite pleased to present um, the winner for his book, Ending Slavery, How We Free Today's Slaves, which by the way, if you're interested, there are copies that will be for sale outside afterwards that he would be more than happy to sign, he's told me. Um, and I'm going to introduce Kevin Bales, our 2011 winner. Thank you, Roger. Thank you so much, Roger, for that. That, that was very kind. Of, I, I just have to correct that um, even though I'm the president of this organization, to call me an administrator uh, is, uh, is not at all fair. Uh, because one of the things I, I learned very early was that uh, while I, uh, and this may be important to you as students as you get older to understand uh, the difference between leaders and managers, because I'm a pretty good leader, but I'm a really terrible manager. And about the time the organization grew to the point that we needed things like uh, health insurance, they said, uh, get that guy out of the office, because I was starting to blow it in terms of uh, making sure everything was all right for everyone. It's a great honor, obviously, it's a great honor to uh, receive this award. And, um, and I have to say, uh, especially for this book, because uh, this book is, isn't my own work, and that doesn't mean I plagiarized. What it means is that uh, this, the information in this book was, was brought together from a very large number of people who were liberators, who were the Frederick Douglasses and the Harriet Tubmans of today, people who are risking their lives to get people out of slavery in the modern underground railways, in the modern uh, situations of real liberation, and from a lot of people who were um, hard at work thinking through how to bring people out of slavery in the 21st century, how to build the policies, how to build the, 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 the systems and therapeutic nature of reintegration and rehabilitation so that when people do come out of slavery, their lives will be full lives, full citizens, good education, healthy people with lots of dignity. Uh, all of those people, lots of people, 
uh, were very generous in sharing their ideas, and I was bringing them together into this book. So when I, when I accept this award, I, I don't accept it for myself. I accept it for the modern anti-slavery movement who, who provided the ideas and, the, and helped me to synthesize them into thinking about, about how to bring an end. And they're, in fact, the ones who taught me how we can bring an end to slavery today probably in the next 25 to 30 years. Now, I also want to point to a, a wonderful sort of, um, a wonderful uh, parallel. Because here we are uh, celebrating the, uh, 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 an award at a moment when, it's, with any luck, we're coming to the end of a 230 year period of anti-slavery work. So we're at a point where we need this award uh, not just for the very generous monetary value, but because it helps to legitimate this idea across uh, the United States and across the world. It helps to legitimate this idea and elevate it to the point where politicians and policymakers can, can get it. But what you don't know is that this anti-slavery movement, which is more than 200 years old, began with an award. It began with a prize given by, uh, for, sorry, given for an undergraduate essay. Now, uh, I know that as the intellectual output is so great at Louisville, I don't have to translate Latin uh, for you. Uh, but in case there's any visitors from University of Kentucky, <laughs> I, I will. But I, were, I first want to explain something. At Cambridge University in England in the, at the end of the 18th century, in the, eight, in the 1780s, the 1780s, they had an annual Latin essay contest. Now, to us, that doesn't sound all that exciting, a Latin essay contest. But in the 1780s, the, the student who won the, the, Lat, the annual Latin essay contest, it was kind of like getting a Rhodes Scholarship or getting named as the smartest student in the country in your graduating class. And the person who won the Latin essay contest would be guaranteed a great career in government, in, in the church, whatever, in politics. It was, it was something that separated you out from all the other 22-year-olds and lifted you up. OK, there was a young man who was at Cambridge who had struggled hard to get there because he didn't come from a rich family. He didn't come from an aristocratic family. His name was Thomas Clarkson. And Clarkson knew that his way forward in life was to win a prize like this. Because he didn't come from a well-off family. He didn't have the kind of connections you needed at the end of the 18th century to make a great career. And he had set his goal from the time he was a first year to win the Latin essay contest so in, uh, in order to make for himself a brilliant career and a great you know, life of riches and power and so forth. So in his year, the question was, is it moral to enslave others against their will? Is it moral to enslave others against their will? Now, again, if I put that question to you as students and said, I want you to write, is it moral to enslave others against their will? You would write, no, and pretty much have answered the question. But you have to understand that at the time that his, his the, 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 the official of the university who set the question had said it, Slavery was absolutely and perfectly legal. Absolutely legal. The trade in slaves was legal. Holding people in slavery was legal. And what's more, the church, the established church of, of England, the Church of England, was absolutely on the side of slaveholding. The church itself owned slave plantations in Jamaica. The major politicians and the royal family all owned slaves and slave plantations. The governor, uh, the, sorry, the mayor of London had made so much money out of the slave trade that when his 10-year-old son wanted piano lessons, he hired Mozart to teach his, give his son weekly lessons. In other words, it was completely acceptable, legal, morally acceptable according to the church, and absolutely seen as an essential part of the national economy. An, a pillar of the national economy, one of the most important areas of employment and wealth generation in the country. And economic historians of today tell us that 
the global slave trade of the 1780s is equivalent in its size and power to the global automotive industry of today. So the question itself was a radical challenge to the status quo. And there was a whole series of reasons why this particularly conservative university administrator had, he had seen some things that had deeply disturbed him about the nature of slavery. And he decided to take, in some ways, the most and only radical uh, action in his whole life, and that was to set an essay question. So those of you who are faculty members, you might want to think, what could I do to set a radical essay question in the future? Um, now Clarkson, as the student, didn't care. He didn't care what the question was. He just wanted the prize. But he dug in, and he, was, and he insisted that he was going to do everything possible to win this prize. So he read widely, he wrote carefully, he got deeply into the subject. He won the prize and had immediate offers of big jobs in government and in the church and so forth. But he turned them all down because he said, if what I have learned in the production of this essay is true, someone must act. Someone must do something. He had been changed by the research that he had done. That he had opened his eyes to this. Now, Thomas Clarkson is 21, 22 years old when he graduates with this prize. And the interesting thing is that you actually know him, even though you've never heard his name before. He's the person who did these, these pictures. Every student knows the pictures of the slave ships with the bodies racked upon them. After he left the university, he joined with 11 other people and founded the Committee for the Abolition of the, of the Slave Trade within the British Empire. And he became its first secretary as a brand new college graduate. There were other brand new college graduates in that 12 person group. And they began the first human rights campaign in history. And they also formed what was fundamentally the first human rights group in history and the first NGO in history the first non-denominational, non-governmental, independent organization made up of people from different backgrounds aimed at changing something to do with human rights. And they said, the first thing we've got to do is really get the skinny on this. We've really got to come to understand what this problem is about. Tom, you were good on that essay. Get over to Liverpool and really find out what goes on in the slave trade. And one of the things that he did was to discover exactly how slaves were packed into ships and about the death rate on those ships and so forth, as well as, and this was a very powerful argument of the time, what was the death rate among the British sailors, which was also extremely high. His award led to great things of that Latin essay award, not the things he dreamed it would be. Now, I want to be absolutely clear as we leap from the slavery of two, more than 200 years ago to the slavery of today that we're actually talking about the same slavery. Slavery today isn't legal, it's not considered moral, but the fundamental action of one person enslaving another has not changed. And if you look across all history, you will find that if a person has been completely controlled by another person, that violence is used to maintain that control, that, that threat of violence or use of violence is maintained used to control people to exploit them, that they receive no pay, that they have no free will, they can't walk away. That describes all slavery, the slavery of today and the slavery of the past as well. If we use that de definition, which is in fact a narrow definition, some, some UN de definitions get a little loosey-goosey on the edges and pile other people in there. But if you use a, a definition that applies across all history, you still get to a point where we our best estimate is about 27 million people in that situation. Now, you might be thinking, 27 million, how on earth did we get there? It's 2011, and I have to say, you know, it's a big number. If, if you're not familiar, it's actually double the number that were taken out of Africa in the entire 350 years of the transatlantic slave trade. But that 27 million is in large part as large as it is, because we live in a world with seven billion people. We've had a, a, a population explosion over the last 50 to 60 years. The population's gone from two billion to seven billion. Most of that growth is in the poorest parts of the world, in the developing world. But now, mind you, 
having a lot of people does not make them slaves. It's just that there's a large pool of people who live in the poorest parts of the world who are, and if you see, notice by the second factor, who are vulnerable. They've suffered poverty and vulnerability caused by everything from HIV epidemics to the tsunamis and earthquakes and climate change problems and civil wars and ethnic cleansing. You name it, right? You name it. The things that can happen to you around the world today that can push you into vulnerability, push you into uh, a, an inability to protect yourself, to, that taken away your security. All of those things have created a very large pool of people who cannot necessarily protect themselves from enslavement. Remember, slavery is about the taking control of someone's life and using violence to maintain that control. But even that doesn't, you know, being very poor and being very vulnerable doesn't make you a slave either. To do that, you've got to have someone who is willing to use violence, use control to take control of you. And that usually requires corruption, governmental corruption. Or in other words, if you live in a place where the rule of law will not protect you, you know, if someone's coming with a gun to say, take control of your life, and you can't call the police, or worse, if it is the police who are coming to take control of you, then you're simply not protected. Now, interestingly, and it, there's a paradox about most of the numbers I'm going to tell you, but one of the paradoxes is this. We have 27 million people in the world in slavery, but if you actually look to see how many people in the world live in places where they are both extremely vulnerable and the rule of law does not protect them, that number is around 600 million. Now, I say paradoxical because it, it, it means that the number of slaves is far below the number of potentially enslavable people. Flip it around and you also see that we now have a glut of enslavable people compared to those who actually become enslaved. Now, I've talked about violence being used to take control of people. And that certainly continues today. And there are certainly people who are born into hereditary forms of slavery today. But for the most people who enter slavery for the first time today, who are brought into slavery anew in this year, it's not because someone has pointed a gun at them. It's, someone, it's because someone has asked them this question, which I appreciate is a, is a pretty challenging question to put in front of college students who may never hear this in real life. They'll only see it occasionally in a lecture. So I don't mean as a taunt. I just mean it as a, as a way of illustrating the fact that for most of the people who come newly into slavery today, it's because someone is preying on their vulnerability, using their vulnerability to trick them. And also, because I want to make a point that's, I think, really important. And that is to understand that the people who are taken into, who are drawn into slavery, and especially into human trafficking, the people from Mexico or China or other countries who are trafficked into the United States today, they do so because they are doing what you or I would do in the same situation. They have hungry kids. They're hungry themselves. They live in a place without security or safety. They can't get medicine when they need it, when, when their family members are sick. And when someone says to them, you know, you've got, you could work hard. I, I've got this job in this other country. I can help you to get there. They'll, they may worry about how sketchy this person is who's offering this job. But they'll step into it because like you or I would do, they think, I've got to do something to better my situation. I've got to do something that will feed my kids. I've got to do something to get us out of this place that's not safe to live. So they take the chance, they say yes, and they end up in slavery. I think it's important to remember that they're not that different to us. They're just not so lucky as us. This is um, one of the children who didn't answer that question for herself, but in fact, her mother answered her, it for her with the best will in the world. She uh, lived in a small village uh, in rural Ghana. Uh, uh, someone came to her village and said to her mother, 
uh, you know, um, we are doing some fishing work down on Lake Volta. There's a, we really need some young people to help us to clean fish part of the time and sell them in the market. And, you know, your daughter, she's so energetic and she seems so bright. It would be so great to have her and we'll make sure she gets all the food she needs to eat and she can go to school part time and so forth. And uh, we'll even give you an advance on her wages right now. And you know, the mom is caught in a horrible dilemma, in a devil's choice, thinking, if my daughter goes, I can't keep an eye on her. How can I be sure she's safe? But if she stays, she may die of disease or, or malnutrition, as my other child has done. And if she goes, maybe she'll get that food, maybe she'll get that education. And of course, with that advance that, that, that I'm being offered, I could feed my other kids for a couple of months. And some parents say no for all the right reasons. And some parents say yes for all the right reasons. And her mother said yes. Her mother had hope of an opportunity, let her go to the lake. And of course, the situation there was horrific. Her mother had no idea where she had actually ended up. They always tell them the wrong place. She was. Uh, forced to dive underwater with stones tied to her ankles to untangle nets. Uh, the children who are used that way, if they drown, they just throw them away because they're so cheap to get. Uh, they're, uh, when they get a little older than this, they're, all, they're always sexually abused, they're physically abused. The good news is this good little girl was rescued. We, we work with groups there and we help kids, we take people away from there and we bust these slaveholders at the lake. And that's actually a rehabilitation center where she's sitting in a classroom. But, you know, she ended up in that kind of horrific slavery for all the right reasons. So, it, so that's a key thing to know. Now, there is one thing new about slavery. I've actually been pointing to things that everything I've said so far is, could be applied to the present moment from that kind of luring people with opportunity or forcing them with, with violence. Uh, all of that applies throughout human history and it applies today as well. But there's one new thing, just one new thing really about slavery. And that is that the price of human beings has completely collapsed. Absolutely and completely collapsed. In the same way that the price of computing in the last 50 years has gone from computers that cost half a million dollars or a million dollars and fill a huge room like this to computers with more power that cost a hundred dollars and fit in your hand. It's been that kind of collapse. Now, there's one thing I want to show you, though, to really demonstrate what that collapse is like. Now, I have to bend over here and plug the sound line back in because it was making a buzzy noise. So, one second. As always, as we get macro economic commodities, continuing here in the studio with our guest Michael O'Donoghue, head of commodities at Four Continents Capital Management, and we're also joined by Brent Lawson from the Lawson Frisk Securities. Happy to be here. Good to have you with us, Brent. Now, gentlemen, Brent, where do you want to go this year? Well, Daphne, we've been going short on gas and oil recently and casting our net just a little bit wider. We really like the human being story a lot. Uh, if you look at a long-term chart, prices are historical lows, and yet global demand for forced labor is still real strong. So that's a scenario that we think we should be capitalizing on. Michael, what's your take on the people's story? Are you interested? Well, definitely. Non-voluntary labor's greatest advantage, if that's it, is the endless supply. We're not about to run out of people. No other commodity has that. Daphne, if I may draw your attention to one thing, that is that private equity has been sniffing around, and that tells me that this market is about to explode. Uh, Africans and Indians, as usual, uh, South Americans, and Eastern Europeans in particular are on our buy list. Interesting. Michael, bottom line, what's your recommend? We're recommending to our clients a buy and hold strategy. There's no need to play the market. There's a lot of vulnerable people out there. It's very exciting. Fantastic. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Okay, I, I saw some jaws coming down, but I want you to know that's not real. That's a, that's a spoof. Uh, and it's actually a piece that I wrote with MTV Europe that we put out. I wanted to show it to you, A, because it's kind of funny as a spoof, but also because it actually makes very clear the reality of the present moment what, when you have a collapse in the price of human beings. Uh, and, if, and if slavery were still legal, 
that's precisely what you would be seeing on the Bloomberg Channel, would be something like that. Now, here, here's the reality. Uh, here's a picture of slave prices over the last 4,000 years. Uh, the average price of a slave for most of human history has been uh, about forty to fifty thousand dollars in today's money. I'm going to pull this thing again. Get rid of that buzz. Um, and a perfect illustration of this would be how much did slaves cost in Kentucky? If we go back to 1850 and we wanted to buy an average slave in Kentucky in 1850, the average type of slave, and we have tons of records for this in Kentucky and all the Deep South states, uh, was what was called a prime field hand, a 19-year-old guy who could, who could work in the fields. So no special talents, no special strengths, no special anything, just the regular kind of guy that you could get out and put in a cotton field or an agricultural field to work. A prime field hand in 1850 sold for 1000 to 1200 $1850. But what else could you buy in 1850 for $1000 or $1200? Well, you could buy a house, a whole nice house. You could buy 3, 4, 500 acres of land. You could buy any number of very large scale items or you could buy one 19-year-old worker. Now, if you think about that, you begin to realize why the equivalent of $1000 in 18 50 is in fact about forty to fifty thousand dollars in today's money. Slaves have been capital purchase items. And you can see why slaves were insured, why people tried to keep them alive, even if they mistreated them, they tried to keep them alive, because they represented a very large capital investment. You can see that at about the time of the population explosion, that red line is population, about the time of the population explosion in the last sixty or so years, the price of human beings fell very precipitously as the market began glut, became glutted with uh, a supply of enslavable people. And the price of human beings, which had been higher, maybe not in the 50,000 range, but certainly in the, in the 10,000 range, has now collapsed so that the average price around the world is about $90, $90. And that simply puts us into a situation where People, instead of being capital purchase items, have become disposable inputs into the economic process. Whatever that economic activity is that a slaveholder is engaged in, they're now disposable inputs. So they've, they've gone from being like buying a tractor to buying a styrofoam cup, something that you use in a way that's useful, but when you're finished, you crumple up and throw away because it's not necessary to maintain them and certainly cheaper if a slave gets injured or ill today, it's cheaper to toss them or kill them or whatever and replace them because that little girl, for example, that advance on her wages that was all a part of a, of a, of a trick that was handed over, that how much did that cost them to hand over? It was probably $10 or less that was used as part of the trickery to take that child away. The total cost of getting that child from their home into a situation of enslavement and use was probably less than $20. And that's not unusual. If the average around the world is 90, I've got to say I've, I've known a number of uh, people around the world enslaved for $10 and less. This is one of those um, disposable people. I, I, I think the, the, they're small boys in Nepal. We, we do work with these kids in Nepal. Uh, there in Nepal, there's very few roads, but there's a great deal of quarrying. The, the job given to these slave children is simply to load them with very large stones and make them climb up and down mountains to deliver these stones to the city. Like I say, there's no roads. It ha all the transport has to ha happen on mountain paths. So these kids are trucks. They're stone delivery vehicles and they go up and down these mountains and they get bent in their back, their bones are ruined, their knees are ruined, they fall off cliffs and get killed and then they just go get another kid. This is a, their disposable inputs. Now, all of that that I've been telling you is pretty horrible, pretty depressing. Children and adults, cheap, disposable, crushable, and a huge number of people in that situation. But I want to shift the gears and really get to the point of 
of the book that was the point of the Grawmeyer Award. And I want, to, I want to point to how a lot of the things that I've been telling you are horrific, but are in fact at the same time hopeful. I know it sounds very strange for me to say that things I was just telling you are in some ways hopeful. Now this particularly cryptic little slide is about the fact that the numbers tell two stories. 27 million people is a lot of people to be in slavery. But 27 million is also, in our seven billion dollar, a billion person popu global population, is the tiniest fraction of the world population to ever be in slavery. So we have, in 2011, the tiniest fraction of the global population to ever be enslaved. Likewise, slaves generate something like 40 to 50 billion dollars into the global economy. And that, in the scale of our current global economy, is the tiniest proportion of the global economy to ever be represented by slave labor and slave output. It's not the global automotive industry. It's not the slave industry of the past. It doesn't actually add up to much of anything in the global economy of today. And with that fact, that fact that we have pushed slavery to the very edges of our global society, that it's illegal in every country, it's immoral according to all religions, it's rejected by virtually every citizen who has any sense of law and, and morality, it's pushed right to the edges, under the rocks, swept under the rugs of our global society. And it is in so many ways standing on the edge of the precipice of its own extinction, waiting for us to give it a good hard boot and knock it over the edge. Now, how do we do that? How do we do that? I'm going to give you just a couple of examples. One, and one of the things that was developed in writing the, the book Ending Slavery, is this idea of the slavery lens. And what that means is, it's, if, if you've studied international development, you've, you've, you've studied the gender lens about how in the 1960s, 70s, and into the early 80s, all over the world, large-scale international development agencies begin to understand that if, wait, if we think about women, our development programs will actually be more powerful. That one of the problems of the past of why development programs seemed like a waste of money was they kept doing, giving the money to the men in rural villages, and those men were blowing it, which is not a big surprise, you know, if you know anything about men. So, they said, we have to really focus on how women would build the communities and knit the communities. And as they brought the gender lens to bear, they discovered, wow, this is transforming the effectiveness of international development. We've discovered the same thing. If you bring a gender lens to issues that you're concerned about, if you bring a slavery lens to issues that you're concerned about, it helps you to see them in a new way. Now here's an example of, of what that slavery lens means to environmental work. Why uh, is it the fact that all around the world, and even at the global level, environmental treaties and regulations are passed in Copenhagen, in all, you know, they're trying to get one in Copenhagen, in, uh, at a national level, an international level, treaties are passed to bring an end to environmental destruction, but they don't work. The amount of environmental destruction that goes on continues to be high, global warming continues to increase, CO2 production seem, continues to increase. Some of it's slowed, but it's not being reversed. Why? One reason, and a very, we think, very potent reason, is that a great deal of the environmental destruction that occurs around the world is being accomplished with slave labor. That the people who are cutting down the forests in the Amazon or in West Africa or in Central Africa or across South Asia, just talking about de deforestation for a moment, are actually using slaves to do that work. They don't obey regulations. They don't listen to treaties. They're criminals who are as happy to enslave people as they are to do a smash and grab on the environment. And once you understand that fact, that you're not dealing with industries that can be regulated, but criminals operating on a very large scale who are destroying the environment outside the boundaries of the rule of law, you begin to understand how, ah, 
A slavery lens tells us how to approach this issue in a different way. It tells us how to approach it in a way that we can bring possibly this destruction to an end. And if you notice that this is a, this funny little diagram, I'm really sorry, I, I hate to put up stuff that looks like this, but you know, it, there's, it's circular. You know, the more you get the destruction, the more people you drive into vulnerability, the more people you can enslave to put to more destruction, to make more profits on the global export market. Because virtually all of that enslavement and all of that environmental destruction is actually aimed at you. It's aimed at you. Shrimp, gold, timber, beef, the steel for your cars, virtually all of that's coming out of that environmental destruction. So put a lens on it that helps you to understand that the ubiquitous nature of even a small amount of slavery can have an enormous impact. Second thing. Oh, here's a picture of some <laughs> slaves in a gold, open pit gold mine in Ghana, uh, just to give you a little sense of environmental destruction. That used to be a national forest, a national protected park uh, in the jungle in Ghana where lots of amazing endangered species live. Um, you can see what it looks like now. The second thing that I want to point to out of a, quite a larger toolkit is what we call the freedom dividend. And another thing that we were, we were learning as I was writing that book about ending slavery, we were beginning to understand that as people come out of slavery and into freedom, you can stop thinking about them as victims. You can really think about the power that freedom brings to the lives of people once they've achieved it. And what it means is that when people, if you give them the chance, come to freedom, if you make sure that you oper open up economic opportunity to them, if you open up educational opportunity to them, you, you will see an enormous increase in the economic activity in the, of the communities in which they live, a real spiraling upwards of the, of the economies in which they live. Now that's important as well because when we've taken the freedom lens and we've applied it to organizations like the World Bank, in Nepal who are doing an a, attempting to do economic development with the with rural people in Nepal what we discovered and they discovered was of course this is these programs aren't working the guy who's taking the money is actually a slaveholder it's never reaching the people who are in, in hereditary slavery they're never going to be able to crack through the ceiling of enslavement but once we crack the ceiling of enslavement all of a sudden, the economic activity and the ep economic development and social development that was sought becomes a reality. Now, I, here's just a, another little picture. I love these two pictures because uh, this is in northern India. Uh, uh, the entire village here was enslaved in a quarry, a stone quarry, uh, and the families were in hereditary slavery. It's a particular kind of slavery called um, hereditary collateral debt bondage slavery. Uh, but in that kind of slavery, basically, uh, it, the slavery passes down from generation to generation. And so uh, granddad there was born into slavery. He doesn't even remember how far back the slavery goes. He just doesn't know. He could have been his grandfather. He has no idea. So we're at least four generations of slavery here. His son, Ramphal, is the young man standing there, is his name, and his two kids. This has taken just days after that village was liberated by our workers there doing a kind of community organizing model. Now I wanted to show you the picture of them there and see how scrawny and ragged and troubled they look even though they've just come out of slavery and then show you a picture from about a year later of Ramphal with a good haircut and <laughs> nice clothes and notice he's got a radio in his hand which is like a big status symbol where he is. His wife has got a brand new sari. You can't quite see his kids there, but they're dressed nicely. They're in school. They've learned to read and write. And here's the thing that, that kind of blows my mind about this particular guy. One of the reasons I, I just love to talk about him is that he kept working in the quarry. Uh, we got him a mineral lease so he could open with others their own quarry. They knew how to quarry rocks and they knew how the, to, they, they would, could be sold. So he kept working in the quarry. A lot of the people who came out of slavery said, I'm so sick of this quarry, I never want to go back. They all got their kids out, of course. But that's only his part-time job, because as soon as he started earning money in the quarry, he started buying costumes, because he organized a drama troupe. 
a drama troupe that tours during the Indian wedding season and performs at those lavish Indian weddings. And they are all dressed like Krishna and all these Indian gods and they have musicians and these amazing costumes and he gets to act and write plays and his plays, you know, Krishna is always like beating up ex-slaveholders or slaveholders and he expresses this. Now, what's beautiful about that to me is that his family are economically stable now. They're autonomous. They earn their own living. His kids are in school. They're citizens. They've learned about voting. They've learned what it means. They can read and write. They've got that too. But they've also got their insides, their, their, their ability to really express themselves. And who would have ever known that within this enslaved stonebreaker was Al Pacino or whatever, whoever it might be. I, it's just uh, remarkable to me. Now, how much does it cost to get these people out of slavery? Now, this is one of the things that in the calculations that we were doing to work up to publishing this book floored us. We realized that to get Ram Falls family, all, all of those kids and granddad and everybody out of slavery wasn't actually $400. It was about 150 because things are really inexpensive in North India. In Ghana, that little girl that you saw in the school, her, the cost of her rescue and reintegration and re rehabilitation is about $400. And if you come to the United States, uh, if you have a human trafficking victim who's been enslaved in the United States, the federal government recommends about $30,000 over a three-year period. Well, not surprising when you know how much med medical care and legal care and so forth costs in the US. But the point is that most slaves don't live where it costs $30,000. Most slaves in the world actually live where it costs $150. And the average price around the world, if you average out by the numbers of where the slaves are and the cost of getting them out of slavery and into a new life, is about 400. Okay, multiply that up by 27 million, and you get 10.8 billion. Now, since we just finished with the final four, I thought I'd point out that the NCAA, you know, the uh, College Athletics Association, just signed a new, after, on the end of the final four, signed a new TV deal for next year for $10.8 billion. It's what the NCAA gets for its TV deal. It's what Americans spend in a year on potato chips. It's about what Americans spend on blue jeans in a year. $10.8 billion, I used to think it was a lot of money until they started bailing out banks for $100 billion. Uh, to me, it, now I realize this is chicken feed. And the point is, we don't even need 10.8 billion this year. We don't even need it next year. We need 10.8 billion over the next 25 to 30 years. So it's not even this, that, you know, it doesn't mean all right this minute. Now, okay, I admit, I think over, if it's gonna take us 30 years to bring slavery to a, almost to an end on the planet, it's gonna cost more than this, almost certainly inflation and everything else. But even if it goes to 20 billion or 30 billion, it's still chicken feed in the global economy. It's still next to nothing. And the reason why we are doing this kind of calculation so carefully, and the reason why we're putting out a toolkit in a book like Ending Slavery that actually explains all the different steps across all the different factors about how you can bring slavery to an end, but with economic autonomy, citizenship, literacy and education, and dignity, is because we don't want to do what happened in Kentucky and the other parts of the South in the United States in 1865. Four million slaves were lifted up out of legal slavery in 1865 and then dumped. No access to credit or asset formation. No access to decent education. No access to real political participation. Certainly no access to dignity as they suffered prejudice and discrimination and violence. It was a botched emancipation. One of the, we learned a lot when we studied it as we began to think through how do we bring slavery to an end on the planet. Well, the American example is the perfect negative example. We said nobody on our watch comes out of slavery and then lives as a second class citizen. We're not putting up with that. We know we can't, we don't want to do that. We in the United States are still paying the price.
for the botched emancipation of 1865. The, the problems that we created then are echoing and echoing in our society and continue to echo today. Which is why if we don't do that, if we help families to achieve a stable life with citizenship and education, if we help them to create an expectation in their community where they're watchful for each other and vigilant so we can say their communities have become slave proof, can actually become slave proof, we know that we can replicate those slave proof communities. And in some ways, you know, the other thing that we know is easily possible is that in the same way that those communities or those now areas the size of counties can become slave free, we know that a country like the United States could easily become slave free. There may be 40 to 50,000 slaves in America today, but there's no reason why they should be here. We've got honest cops for the most part. We've got plenty of resources to bring to bear in, 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 in the criminal investigations. We've got people who are ready to provide the support and the shelter for the people who have come out of slavery. We've got everything it needs. And yet, this country has never had one single day from the time Columbus landed on the beach until today without slavery. There's never been a day without slavery in the United States. But we could, we could do it. We could be the country that actually demonstrates this to the world. If there's anything that we all can agree on, it's got to be that slavery's got to come to an end. And if there's something that is the most a horrific insult to our human dignity. I, I, I have to think it's slavery. I, I appreciate that there are all kinds of injustice and violence and exploitation that we need to worry about. But it's also true that if you take injustice and violence and exploitation and you roll them together into a very potent form, you've got slavery. And we've got to say, well, wait a minute, we all hate this, we all reject this, and yet if we have the power that we have, and I appreciate university students don't feel that powerful, but compared to the people in most of the world, you're rich and you're powerful. And certainly people who are left university are even richer and even more powerful compared to the people in most of the world. And if we've got that power, that political power and that economic power, and we can't use it to end slavery, what's the point of it? Is it really just for a bigger TV? Is it really just for a nicer car? Or can we use it to change the world? And I have to ask you, if we can't choose to do that, if we can't decide to bring slavery to an end, are we really free? Thank you so much. Questions? My guess is that he's done this before. Can you handle the question and answers on it? I, I, I think it's probably so. <laughs> um, so, have we any questions? How much time do we have? Just so well, we know. We have room for three hours. No, oh, okay, no. Oh, 25 more minutes. Yeah. I think it's okay, I'm not going to call on you first, sir, because I always want the students to go first if there's one ready. Because those young minds are just so, fir well, they're mostly dulled, but yes, ma'am. I'll repeat the question, don't worry. All the research that focuses on women in slavery seems to <coughs> only focus on them as like sex slaves. Yes, ma'am. Are there any ways to like estimate the numbers of women in other types of slavery? Yes, yes, yeah, sort of. The question is that she's pointing out the fact that, that the research that she's been reading about uh, slavery and slavery and women seems to only focus on them as enslaved, uh, women enslaved into prostitution, as sex slaves. Um, and I appreciate that, that, that a great deal has been published about, about enslavement into prostitution, in large part because that's one of the most predominant forms you find in North America and Western Europe. And it's also what the media has been reporting. The fact of the matter, however, is that across the entire world, that's a very small slice of the pie of slavery. Maybe six or eight percent of all slavery is in fact sex slavery or sex, enslavement into prostitution. Uh, the, her question was, is there, is there an estimate of the number of women who are across all slavery? And the answer to that is no, not really. However, 
if we've got something like 27 million in slavery, what we actually know about it is if you look worldwide, the, um, the distribution by gender and age pretty much matches the populations of the countries involved. So that, you know, it's like that family I showed you. You know, that family was in slavery. And most of, in most parts of the world, slavery can involve entire families or different subgroups of families which are some in all male, some are female, all female, some are mixed, some are just kids. And in some ways, we pretty much assume that slavery is equal opportunity. That the number of kids, the number of men, and the number of women is pretty much close to what they are in the global population. It's a guess. That's a guess. But I, we think that's a, that's a stronger guess. Now, there was a question in the back. Yes, ma'am? Um, how many people do you all have, like, actually travel with you to deliberate people, like, Katie, Donna, and Paul, and Matthew, and Paul, and Matthew? So the question is, how many people do we have that actually go out there and travel to, to actually, they tend to just live there, um, to do these liberations? Uh, because, in fact, I, sh I should say, we, we don't parachute in. To, to rescue people. You have to have local people who speak the languages, know the cultures. You know, when you take a child from slavery, in a sla like enslaved in a carpet loom, and they're terrified, because they've been beaten, they've been, they've been malnourished, they've been told over and over by their slaveholder that, that any other person is, a, is probably gonna try to kill them. They're terrified at the moment of rescue. And if you can't look like them, and say to them in their own language, little buddy, it's gonna be okay. Right? It's not going to work. But the answer to your question is, we probably have, through our partner organizations at, at the local level, 200 to 300 people who are engaged in this in the countries where we work, something like that. Uh, the sad news here is that we need, I don't know, two or 300,000 to really make this work. But, you know, we're, we're, bring, we're now bringing out, after 10 years, 11 years of operation, we're bringing out people out of slavery in the low thousands per year. But we're confronting millions. And we actually know how to do it now. We've really got the methods of liberation and reintegration figured out for areas where there's m literally hundreds of thousands of people waiting. But we just don't have the person power to make that happen. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering, I mean, historically speaking, a lot of human rights campaigns have difficulty, especially now that we have an overabundance of images of suffering and we tend to like, desensitize yep. in countries like the United States to these kinds of images and people don't really focus on this and they don't necessarily want to believe that this is happening or that there can be anything done about it. Which is why I think your message is so good because you do talk about hope and how this is actually practical. But do you still find that you're facing a lot of... Um, like, do you have difficulty sort of proving your case or making your case? Mm -hmm. The question's about, here we are in an overloaded society with charity fatigue and so many other conflicting concerns and so forth. And do we have, in that context, particularly in the United States, any difficulty proving our case? You know, making it clear what's possible and, 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 and the realities of the, of the horrific nature of the human rights violation of slavery in the first place. And the answer, the basic answer is no, in that uh, I think one of the reasons, and I, won't, I would never want to second guess a prize committee, but I think one of the reasons why perhaps this uh, prize landed on this piece of work is that it's a very careful, empirical set of investigations that build up to proof as opposed to sensation. There's a lot of organizations who are concerned about different types of human rights violations, but who want to sensationalize those as ways of raising awareness to get people all worked up about it. That's fine, but you gotta go where, know where you're going. And if you don't know where you're going, ultimately you'll lose the audience. You'll lo they'll say, well, there's just no there, there's no there there. Now, I will say, the United States has a very unique media world, culture with the highest noise to content ratio of any media in, of any country in the world. So, you know, the media of the United States is like this enormous river of, I don't want to say sewage, but, you know, I mean, it's like this huge <laughs> river and of, of mixed up dirty water with like one or two pearls floating in it. And they, the, the, when the pearl does get close to you, it just kind of flies by and, and, you're, and then you're back to all this other junk. 
and on the zillions of channels and zillions of blogs and so forth. So it's, if you don't have a billion dollars like Coca-Cola to do your annual advertising, it's a little hard to penetrate minds that are awash in noise with the, when all you've got is a pearl of content. Yes, sir. Yeah. The, the question is, how dangerous is it for our workers to do liberation? And the answer is, it's dangerous. Uh, it's not as dangerous as you might think. And the reason I say that is because we spend an awful lot of time thinking carefully and planning to reduce the danger. So we know that when a, a family is going to be liberated in that, like that family in the, of stone quarry workers, right? We know there will be a moment when they stand up to the slaveholder and say, this is it, we're done. That that's the moment when the slaveholder is going to want to use violence to take, con take back their con that control. And that's why we know that that's the moment we must plan for not to respond violently to their violence, but to create a situation where their violence is bent or twisted or ignored or avoided. So we, we plan very carefully to find nonviolent responses to the violence of, potential, of that potential moment. Now, we actually consider it a failure when there's violence. You know, if there's violence in that situation, we consider that a failure because like, the last thing we can do is help somebody out of slavery and then watch them get shot, right? That's not going to be right. So we work at that very, very carefully. On the other hand, there's also the fact that the workers themselves, uh, our, um, I wish I had a picture to p throw up of Emmanuel Oto, who's our, our lead guy in Ghana. And he's just, he's just a big, handsome guy. And he recently helped the Ghanaians pass a new law against slavery in Ghana. Uh, then he helped take forward the first criminal prosecution for slavery in Ghana that wasn't linked to sex slavery. So it was, in fact, for children who had been enslaved in the fishing industry, like you saw that little girl. They got the conviction. People were, slaveholders were sent to prison. And the minute the judge pronounced the conviction, he started getting death threats. His family started getting death threats. We had to help move them away a little bit. But, you know, I have to say, Emmanuel, like, Every one of our on-the-ground field workers, I called him and I said, Emmanuel, take a holiday. Take your family, go to a beach resort, but don't use a credit card. Just find a place to hang out for like two or three weeks. He said, no, of course not. He said, this is my job. This is what comes with the territory of liberation. And, you know, Frederick Douglass would have said the same thing. Harriet Tubman would have said the same, said the same thing. Yes. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure, sure. So the question is about if, if we're spending $400 to get somebody out of slavery and through the reintegration process, how is that money spent? Um, and the answer is variable according to the type of slavery in the country and so forth, but, I'll, but the gen, there's cer certain generalities that I can give you. Clearly, you've got to pay the salaries of the, of the, of the anti-slavery workers who go and find them and then take them through whatever is the appropriate type of liberation. So if it's children weaving carpets, it's literally kicking in the door, taking the child, and running off with them to a rehabilitation center. Right? If it's the community worker who's done community organizing with the, with the village that's been caught in quarry slavery and so forth, it's, it's to pay their salary. So you've got those salaries, you've got their phone, you've got all that kind of stuff. But then you've got the, what's necessary after liberation, because liberation is the short period, reintegration, rehabilitation is the long period. We figure everyone who comes out of slavery will need to be, for us to be with them for two years at least. And that's making sure that teachers get in there, that they have a chance to get toolkits that they, of the whatever types, that they can find some capital, that we can help them by matching loans or uh, heifer project type provision of uh, livestock, and we, we stick with them to help them get whatever their own governments offer. Because a, a lot of governments have ways to support people who have come out of slavery, but they never know it because they're illiterate and they can't find it. But we know all the ways. And we've got local people who are like their welfare officers, uh, even though that's a little harsh because it's really just to help them find the right programs to make sure they get what's due, their due, right? And, and, this is, and, and so it's, it's all that sort of stuff. There, there's usually some emergency money to make sure they got food and shelter in the first couple of weeks if they've had to flee. But, you know, the price 
of a liberation worker in northern India is $1,200 a year. That's a decent salary in Uttar Pradesh. So if that, and if that liberation worker is working with two or three villages at a time, which they often are, and each village has 30 to 50 families, you can see how the amortized cost of liberation can be as low as $400. Did you want to ask? I, I cut you off because you weren't. Okay. In Nepal? In, the, in Nepal. Was that one? He, he was saying he, that he, he's going to help sell my book because he, that, that the, the, the strongest, the strongest uh, part of the book for him was a, an experience that I went through with other people in terms of confronting liberation uh, at a large scale in Nepal. And I have to say, it's, it's hard for me to tell that story in some ways because it was not a happy story. Uh, we began to work with, and I individually went to Nepal and spent a lot of time working with human rights groups there. And then uh, as, they, as the government changed in Nepal and the democracy became more possible in Nepal uh, through this period of transformation in Nepal, um, and we were able to work with the Supreme Court and with the legislature and so forth to the point that we were saying, look, you've got long-term hereditary debt bondage in the rural areas. You've got other types of slavery in Nepal. You need a decent law against this. Things really need to happen. And we were building a coalition and, and moving step by step in that direction, building pressure on the government, building pressure on the, on the executive. But we built the pressure in a way that the king of Nepal, as he was then, uh, responded finally to what they felt was an embarrassment and a pressure, international embarrassment and a pressure, by issuing a, an, a, a royal order, kind of like a presidential order, that said, okay, bang, uh, we ban this. It's all banned from now on. And this was announced over the radio, and even with uh, uh, some suggestions, although there was no law to back it up, that people who were in slavery would be able to keep the land they were wa working on. They were able to hold on to the land they were working on, even though it was owned by the landowner and they were just working there. Well, I'll admit that when I got the news that they had banned this form of slavery in Nepal, I was just overjoyed. I was just over the moon because I thought, wow, that worked. We got that work. This amazing thing has happened. These people are now free. They're going to be able to keep working and so forth. But what I didn't know was that what, had actually ha what ha began to happen immediately was that as the word went out over the radio in Nepal, the landowners who had radios heard this truth of liberation and heard this suggestion that they would be losing their land, and they just turned their radios off took their guns, went out to the shacks where their slaves lived, and said, everybody out and go, or I shoot you. I mean, they just literally drove them into the fields, onto the highways, into the mountains, because they said, if they're not here, no one can arrest me and no one can take my land. And the result was, from a moment of liberation, to almost instantly somewhere between 30 and 40,000 refugees, people driven from their homes with nothing and pushed into wasteland and then forming their own kind of refugee camps with no food, no medical care, and they began to die. They began to die of disease and yellow fever and all the kinds of things you get when you jam people together. And that was hard. I, got, I mean, I, I have, that's why it's hard for me to talk about this, because I feel I failed. I feel I, I didn't see the, that we were so focused on freedom that we were not focusing on what has to happen the moment after freedom, how much care and security you've got to provide for people in their most vulnerable moment. And, you know, it's a, it's a fact and a, and a guilt in a sense that I, I bear, I, not, I don't bear it alone, but I have to bear it, 
and, and come to understand. But it's a lesson, right? And if, if anything, I can tell you it's never happened like that again. It's not that we've never made mistakes, but we've never made that mistake again. And, you know, we continue to do extensive work in Nepal, and we continue to do very, I think, successful work in Nepal. But I'll, I'll always understand that, you know, it's sort of touching on a previous question about how do you make, a, how do you make your case, or do you just expose and, and sensationalize? Well, you better make your case, and you better make it to yourself as well, and you better think it all the way through when you're dealing with people's lives. Yes? What do you do to combat human trafficking in the developed world? Uh, is it simply a matter of alerting the authorities when you find out that it's going on, or yeah. is it more complicated? There are questions about how, what do we do to combat human trafficking in the developed world? Um, well, and I have to tell you, we, we don't do a lot of work in the developed countries. We concentrate on the poorest countries where the largest numbers of slaves are. But I do know we also work a lot with the organizations that do work in the United States and in the other parts of the developing world. One of the things, and, and, you, and the, the person with the question mentioned, do you contact the police, contact the authorities, and so forth? Well, that's certainly part of it, because in these countries, it's against the law. It's against the law. And uh, the police should be ready to mobilize. There's a hotline number for the United States. There's uh, police who are ready to go, but not very many. And that's, of course, one of the uh, next things you've got to do. You've got to train law enforcement. You, we've got, we, keep, we, we train law enforcement. We keep pushing for law enforcement training. I'm going to give you a, a little tiny nerdy number to help dramatize this. Um, I don't know if you know how many people are murdered in the United States every year. But it's on average about 17,000. So we have about 17,000 people murdered in, in the United States every year. We also have, according to the State Department, about 17,000 people who are brought into this country to be turned into slaves each year. So on one side, 17,000 murder victims, and on the other side, 17,000 new slavery victims. OK? Now, we have about 22,000 police departments in the United States. And every single the police department has at least one, but often an entire crew of homicide specialists to deal with those 17,000 murders. So many that we think there's something like 45 to 46,000 homicide specialists in the United States. We know this because there would be no evening television if it weren't for all those homicide specialists, right? All the different kinds of CSIs and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So, 17,000 murder victims, 45,000 specialists to deal with it in the law enforcement community. 17,000 new slaves. How many slavery specialists in those 22,000 police departments? Maybe 100. Maybe. Maybe, two, maybe up more over 100 now. The last time I asked the person who was most likely to know in the federal government, he said 50. OK. You can see why we need training, right? And in some ways, the countries, again, like the United States, which could be slave free, only just only require a raising and awareness and training to make it happen and some more resources. But why not resources? We've got a law against it. You know, if, if there were, let, I'm gonna, I, let me flip those two numbers again 17,000 murders, the clear up rate on murder is up a, around 90%. So 90% of murders are either solved or they figured out what happened or something. It's cleared up. The clear up rate for slavery and trafficking is under 1%. Now flip those and imagine we were living in a United States where on the cover of Time Magazine it says, big news, right? The number of murders solved is now over 1%. Sadly, 99% of all murders are now are still unsolved. You'd be shocked. You'd think, why, how can we live in a country where no murders get solved? Well, how can we live in a country where no slavery case gets solved? Virtually no slavery case gets solved. It's just kind of bonkers. And you shouldn't ask me this question, because I, I have a little soapbox in me on this particular question, because the, the last part of it is this. Imagine you're at home, it's Saturday afternoon, somebody knocks on the door, and it's me. And I'm wearing a little sash, and it says, give to end murder. And I've got my collecting tin. What are you going to think if someone comes to your door collecting for a charity to end murder? 
you're going to think, what, what are you doing here? This is why we pay our taxes. This is what the police do. I don't have to give to a charity to end murder. But then why do I have to go around begging money to end slavery? It's not right, right? It, we should be saying it should be as crazy to give to a charity to end murder as it is to give to a charity to end slavery. Because the laws are absolutely clear. We are absolutely dedicated in our legal system to the end of slavery, as we are to murder. But I've got to go around and beg. We have to stand on the street with and collect with the tin to bring slavery to an end. So, you know, okay, soapbox over. I'm stepping off the soapbox now. But it's, it's bonkers, right? It's just quite bonkers. And we're going to keep doing it. Because we know that if we don't do it, people will live and die in slavery until governments take the responsibility that they've already assigned to themselves. One more? I was going to say, one more question. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, most of the slavery in the Western world in the U.S. was racially based. Sure. How much of the world's slavery today is racially based? How much slavery of, everywhere heard the question, I think, but how much of the slavery today is racially based? And the answer is, I don't know exactly, but some. So, uh, uh, not the majority, uh, as it had been in the 19th century in our part of the world, but still significant amounts in places like uh, Northwest Africa, uh, uh, race comes into it. But I think the important thing to understand is that that was almost anomalous that very strict, racialist, almost single variable uh, method of determining who was enslavable and who was not. And of course, you take a, a book like White Over Black by um, whatever his name was, which will come to you in a minute, Win Jordan, Winthrop Jordan. Uh, and he explains the process by, by which uh, you know, Europeans and North Americans reached a point where they could exercise a single variable that would determine who was enslavable and who was not. The fact is, throughout all of human history, every type of slavery has been packaged. Right? So you've got the slavery, which is the relationship between slave and slaveholder, which is violence, exploitation, control, no freedom. But then you've got that relationship, and you start putting packages around it. Why is this possible? Because they're the wrong religion. Why is this possible? Because they're a different race. Why is this possible? They're a different ethnicity. Why? Because they're women. Why? Because we captured them in war. Why? Because, it, you know, it, all of those packaging comes with different cultural pictures and so forth, which has helped to confuse us over the centuries to say, wait, uh, is this really slavery or is this about ethnicity or is this about religion or is this about race? No, it's, it's just because every culture has wrapped their slavery in a package of wrappers that in this country was race, but plus religion. You know, the churches in the Deep South said, this is totally okay. Paul says it's okay. The Old Testament says it's okay. It's the descendants of Ham, all that nonsense. And the, an economic rap, wrapping that says, well, even though we don't, like Thomas Jefferson and others used to say, we don't like this, but we can't stop. It's too important to our economy. We, we can't make everybody else unhappy by stopping slavery. So there was an economic, a racial, and a, and a religious wrapping. And, I, and we could actually go on and on about the other types of wrapping that, that go into it. Like the one about we're civilizing them and saving them, right? Another wrapping that was kind of a self-serving wrapping. So the good news, if there is, if you could call it this, about contemporary slavery is that it's absolutely equal opportunity. And that very few slaveholders these days give a hoot about the justification of the rationalization for, for sla enslaving people. Their, their key reason is because I can, because I can. Thank you so much for that. And thank you all for coming. By the way, if you are interested in the book, it does say clearly on the back that all the proceeds go to free slaves. So uh, thank you for coming. Mm. That's true. Should I say that over the mic? Yeah, if you do buy a book, all the, all the royalties and the other proceeds from this book um, go straight to liberation work. I don't get a penny off the books. Uh, and so if you've never done anything but you'd like to get somebody out of slavery, there you go.